Now, how many of you have a clear vision of what your solution should be? Yeah? You know what features you need? Yeah? So, a lot of times, that thing is a nice big castle in the sky, far away in the distance, with little foggy things, with absolutely no foundation, right? Because you haven't actually talked to anybody about it. And so one of the things that Patrick has done is that he has structured a pathway by which you can take that little castle in the sky and ground it to a foundation where instead of building the whole castle before you're done, you actually like build the moat bridge so that people can get to the castle, right? And then we'll worry about the rest of the castle later. Patrick, thanks for right. joining me. So Patrick Hogan. Um, I'm going to burn a little more time today. I'm a local guy. I grew up in an engineering family, and I think that most of Lean is just the scientific methodology with other labels on it. It's develop a hypothesis, figure out how you're going to test it, go run the test, and then synthesize what you learn and feed it back. The foundation of Western civilization, basically, with a lot of other words on it. And so I attack a lot of what I'm going to share today from that perspective. My passion is innovation process had passion about well, how, do, how do you do improvement and about half the time I've been doing startups and learning some of the failed modes for doing innovation and some successful ones uh, and in fact in the enterprise space my experience has almost always been with a product that didn't exist I was asked to help a company say we're here but we want to be here how do we go get there with something we haven't done before so that's been a big part of, of, of my career my main goal is to how do I take the things I'm going to do and help streamline what you build to make something that's compelling for a customer to change what they're doing today and do something different. The first step I'm going to talk about today is how do I create a very precise, detailed hypothesis for the problem I'm going to hit, the persona I'm going to be going after, the scenario that I'm going to be targeting. And the solution that you think is going to match that need, it's, it's you creating that hypothesis and walking through this and putting labels on things in different ways than you would have if you hadn't used this tool so that you can go have a conversation and see if this is really going to, going to help. Close to 40% of my work has been about the research side of going and engaging with a customer and getting great direction out of the right people. If you listen to everyone, it's, it's confusing. You don't know who to listen to because everybody has different desires and different wants. And making sure you're listening to the person that you need to listen to and asking them what they need, which is the third part, is how do you engage? How do you ask them the questions to get the feedback before you've built anything? This is how to get into that conversation. So that's the third step. Deciding what your hypothesis is, targeting the right people for the conversation, then actually guiding the conversation are the three things that are the context for this first conversation today. You're going to unleash the creativity because I'm, I'm introducing a new way to think about value. It's a two-dimensional model for thinking about how you create value instead of what most people do is high to low in what they think about value. So the people who are making the call about what value it is actually have to pretend they are customer they're talking about. It usually unleashes a whole uh, room full of contradictions and confusion, to be honest, because people are using different ones. And it makes sure you're solving a problem. What's happened is, every time I've done this, I've dropped the time to market for a compelling capability by uh, more than 60%. I typically cut about three quarters of the time off of what they thought it was going to take them to create their first thing that was compelling. And very to use John's analogy, is that you may want to build a whole platform, castle, but I can help you bring, make a cottage in a place that people will come and you've got to create the road, the road to get there, but there'll be something that's compelling for somebody at the other end. And that's, going through this process has helped my teams figure that out. The biggest part of doing that and making that cut is it helps teams figure out what they don't need to work on now. Another way I put it is the flip side is I help you go from all the things you could do to what you should do next. And typically that will come into a combination of features you don't even need to build now and the depth of a feature that you may need to build but nowhere near as deep as you thought you could. So what I'm doing is I'm determining a, a value type. And so instead of saying value is low to high, you're going to be starting to put things in buckets, and those buckets will have meaning and consequences. 
It's going to define something that's compelling versus something that's just, quote, valuable. And because it puts the team in the shoes of the customer they eventually pick, when they walk out of the room, they're very aligned with what they're doing because they were involved in the process, the planning process of saying what they're not building, why they're not building it, who they're building it for, and what the deliverable needs to be for that use that makes it compelling. My mission is no, not to make it the best X in the world. My mission is to do it to do Y really easily so I can move on. So come up with a great way to do it, an innovative way to do it, but do it at a lower level and then go to what adds value. So the principle, the typing, again, I introduced this. Most conversations are one dimensional. Somebody somewhere might have a heuristic and they become uh, kind of a gate to hard decisions being built. built. Some very sophisticated dev managers might have some call that they make. But usually it's not very valuable, really valuable. That's kind of the conversation. People might put some things like checkbox or they might have some other words they'd apply. But the two-dimensional model actually introduces two concepts. How do people feel and react to it being there? And how do they feel and react to it being absent? So those actually end up giving a very insightful insight that people actually talk about in their daily life that we're giving you a label for it so your team can debate and deal with conflicts that come up with people having different opinions. The other is we start to include negatives in it. We don't just say up. We say no, negative. And that ends up having a whole different ad to the conversation. But you end up with first two buckets and then a bunch of different buckets. And the first two buckets are, is it essential? And this is the negative side of absent. So if it's gone, is the deal broken? Is it just, is it a, I'm going to use a car because I'm a car guy. Is it, is, is it a beautiful car sitting on cinder blocks because it doesn't have tires and wheels? What are the things that you just have to have and are essential? If it makes it through that gate in the conversation, then there's two choices. One of them is it's a must, it's basically binary. Once you have it and it's doing the job, no one cares. It's a must, and once it's there, it works. If you're talking about a sports car, again, different market, different niche. This is the kind of conversations that we get into with the teams, and some people are making sport cars, and some people are making family stands. You find that out in these conversations. You find out that, hey, good enough. So if you're essential, and it can add more value, the label I put on it, and the one that the documentation has is linear. I don't love it. Everyone tries to change it, but linear is, it has that negative trait that if it's absent, you don't have a product. These are the essentials. Got to have it. You're not in the market if you don't have it. You're not competing. <clears throat> then the others are potentially delighters, where it's not essential, but if it adds some, even a little bit of value, it could potentially be a delight. And this is where the conversation gets really interesting for the team, because then you start to identify what those delighters potentially are and whether you're, you guys as a team can do them better than the, anybody else. Because then you start to look at your team and understand your team's competitive advantage to make something that's compelling. Other categories here at the bottom, super important. <laughs> they sound like they kind of get drifted off, but they're important. Indifference are capabilities that just not important. You talk to a customer, they just don't care. I'll see you later when I talk about the prescription you apply. Those could be things you need to do. You just, customers don't care about them. It might be compliance, it might be legal, it might be you know, other things that they don't think about. But you, if you look at that bucket, you better do a, a, a scrub and make sure that there's something you know, HIPAA <laughs> or some other thing if you're in the medical space. And the final is a detractor. You'd be surprised at how many features I've actually gone through the rigor of asking and teams thought they were going to do it, and there was very important people on the other side of that decision who said, I won't buy it if it has that. So those are things that you that when you get into those bucket and you, you never usually find out and ask the question, well, will you reject this product if you build it? But it, unless you start thinking in two dimensions and talk, think about the hostile side of the equation, it just isn't part of the dialogue. These are buckets that, again, Sophisticated dev managers and other teams kind of have in their head, but they haven't put labels on. They make good judgments. The challenge is always, how do you determine in some kind of rigorous way that everybody agrees on what the label is and they know what to do with it? And, and that's 
what I've tried to develop by stealing from other places and putting them in and helping my team uh, argue out what they're doing and why they're doing it. So let me, a couple of examples. So I'm gonna do the different, those different types, those five just to a cup of coffee. Gotta be hot. Once it's hot, if you're gonna go to a barista and get it, you know it's steaming, you know it's hot, but it's hot. It's gotta be hot. Above 135, don't really care, but it's gotta be hot. Binary. Flavor. The market has proven that you'll pay more for more flavor, but you don't brand on it. Nobody says we have the best coffee in the world. Even Starbucks markets and positions on the experience, right? So that is a linear. More flavor, more money. Great. You can play that game. It's not a new market. My friend's wife, <laughs> we asked her why did she choose the barista in Fremont, she said, oh, they all kind of have the same quality of stuff. One of those, the, the baristas is really good at foam art, so that was what delighted her. So even though the product, they probably even had the same truck pick up, drop by and, you know, give them beans, that's why she chose that one. And cup color. Nobody really cares about cup color. You know, the company may care because they want a brand, and they want everybody to know it, or some people may want, I'm carrying a, a, a brand, because I want to show it off, that, that's, but it's not typically the large part of the market. And if that's what you're doing, if you say my segment is people who want to flaunt what brand of coffee they're doing, you can do all sorts of fun stuff with the rest of that stack and give them gold coffee if you want. So now I'm going to move on to the that's the principles, and that and that's what you're going to do is you're going to we're going to put them into these buckets. And now I'm going to show you how I put the labels on, and then how we end up cutting back. This is a decision tree that I shared with the team. Again, this is very organic. Almost every team I've worked with has printed this out and made a poster and put it up on the wall because it helps them move out of the one-dimensional thinking they're used to and have a common language for the two-dimensional. So the first question, and I say, and this is not on there, is for the target customer with the target scenario. So you say that. We all agree. Oh, yeah, we all agree that that's what we all want. We all know what that is. Is this essential? So this is that first bucket. And if they say yes, this particular thing I'm going to work on is, um, then we walk through the next level where we say, will even stronger performance add more value? Is it a must or not? And if it says no, once it's there, it's there, it's a must. It ends up being a cost you guys have to incur. What I find in platforms is this whole bunch of these things end up being stuff that someone was going to gold plate the heck out of, some complex security thing or some other thing, that once they decide what the scenario is, they don't have to make it anywhere near as complex as that they thought they did. Once you start with that for somebody doing something. Again, if it got, yes, it's essential, and once we have it, additional value could be created if you made a bigger investment, you put it in the, in the linear bucket. And that's the, the more you do, the more you get, the more you do, the more you get. That's the, the reason for the linear. It's not really linear, it ends up being a curve, right? You want to find the diminished returns? Uh, that's the label. So we go back, you bucketed things that are essential, and then you put them into their two buckets. And now you go back and you say, no, it wasn't essential, but will that capability add significant or even just some value? Is there some upside to this thing? And if they say, yes, this is your potential for delighters. The market doesn't expect it. It isn't standard, it isn't what they think. Now you want to make sure it's a delighter. Many teams think it's a delighter and then go find out that the market doesn't care. And it becomes one of the, you have to go up the, the rest of the path to find out that. Does it detract? And you find out that no, it isn't detract, nobody cares. And then, uh, <laughs> yes, it could detract. This is the I don't want perfect freedom for all my uh, users to do whatever they want with and fill in the blank. If you're an IT guy in a uh, large organization, you don't want everybody doing whatever they want, whatever they have, because that's a security nightmare, right? So that's that's one end of the spectrum, but it definitely comes down to decision makers have a different set of criteria and might start putting buckets in this, uh, put things in this bucket. You know, what I'm doing is I'm introducing a taxonomy, I'm getting a team to put things in buckets so they kind of all get where they are. This is a great, you know, experience for the team because they all have to understand that everybody's standing in the same shoes, talking about the same experience, or they get different answers for those things. And so you, you quickly either 
discover the differences or uh, you center in on what you're doing. And so what I did with my team is I would do sticky notes and they would put the stuff that they had to do here. The must went at the bottom. I, I made what I call the, the, the cake. Your job here is to be really innovative in how you do spend as little time and energy on doing this as possible because once you're done with it, nobody cares. You need to find a level for the linears that makes some common sense. And then finally, you're going to find the light. What I've found also when I've walked through this is I find that there's buckets of different kinds of delighters. The teams are highly motivated to make lots of things delighters, and you end up finding that your actual value proposition and the thing you do for that delighter are wildly different. There are different messaging, there are different value props, there are different things. And they've put their linears and must into the bucket they did because they were all really thinking about supporting a different delighter with a different value prop. And so I have never seen less than three diff completely different potential value props. So each of those had different scenarios and they were solving different problems. So if you're going to do one delighter, one delighter theme, your minimum compelling offering that's got to be a delighter becomes actually pretty simple to figure out because your capacity, you want to fix it and you want to get something out. Your delighter is you're going to gold plate that one thing. When the rest of the world realizes something no one thought was important really is. The must are fixed is you got to pay the tax for whether it's security or management or some overhead. What you can control is the level of the linear. There are capabilities where you, you don't just start to diminish, it goes down. Earlier I talked about I'm getting you guys to go from one-dimensional thinking, low to high, to two-dimensional thinking, where absent and present and uh, negative and positive are parts of the conversation. You use two-dimensional thinking. Paradigms before it used to be bugs before features. It used to be one of the developer's paradigms. And this capability says you got to do must before linears. you got to pay the tax before you start moving on and figuring out how deep you can go with the linear. One person per release, one persona per release. And this is saying, if you want to have a compelling offering, you've got to sit down and come up with a hypothesis of one persona delighter per release. So you have a compelling offering. Viable and compelling are not the same thing. As in, just the must is an MVP. You just do what you need to. It works. That may not motivate anybody to do anything. And I'm saying, you've got to do the must of linears and one delighter. Pick one not the seven. I've actually had some teams have 25. You have to find something that's compelling enough to get someone to change. They have something that's happening today. Even being better is not enough because it's changing is not free. To get somebody adopting, get some feedback. And my experience so far is that I mentioned most people said the second dot that people were going to chase ended up being something that had no value. And then they moved on and they did the third dot. And that's the, hey, you originally were going to go after this big market. I'm saying make money in between and make sure that you uh, are on the right track and don't waste your energy building stuff that they don't have. So plan something soon, even if it's only a small part of the potential market. So let me go back and, and retrace what we've done. You, you could bake a cake, and I'm saying make a slice of the cake. So first do your typing and put things in the, in the layers of the cake. Then I define what are the delighters and what problem they're solving. So I'm going, this is where you switch from being feature focus for sure, because it was in your backlog to, oh, what am I doing here with this thing? What is it actually, what is this delighter doing for someone? What job is it getting hired to do? Which is one of the best euphemisms that I've, I've used for it. Make sure you get to one, select one, and that's your MCO release. That's your minimum compelling offering. It's not expected. You're adding something they, don't, they didn't think they were going to get, and you hopefully are going to get some of them. I often then go back as a product manager and go, hey, is this, an address, is this leading us to an addressable market? Is there any reason to get here? So John and I would probably have an interesting conversation about, well, you might be getting some traction here, but is that going to get you to something that actually has a payoff? But you pick one, and then you go back and you revisit all the stacking. Are you still going to put some of these things you put as must in must? Are you going to put some of the things that you had in linears that you thought had to be sophisticated? Did they drop into must? And so refactoring ends up 
changing a whole bunch of stuff that you thought you had to build, you don't need to build, and a bunch of stuff that you do need to build end up going from very sophisticated to very low requirements, and you can value engineer a whole bunch of that stuff because now you know what the scenario is that you're supporting. So, again, must. This is value engineering. You actually get in, I get into conversation with customers to validate these calls by actually coming in and saying, well, this thing we're going to build, we're going to build it down here. And I lower it so much that they go, oh, that's broken. And so you actually don't find until you get a no what yes is, what the right level of yes. Because if you get yes, you could be way beyond what you need to be. Linears. This is the team. The team has to get together and look at all of the linears that are left over. Typically, it's about 40% of the feature set. To create a hypothesis for that, and then go have it validated with the $100 thing. What I typically do is I get the team to do good, better, best on their thing. You can go high to low, and you go good, better, best, and you kind of decide where your, your good and better lines are. So each group goes away and does that, basically their own little layer cake. And then I get them all in a room, and we put them up on the wall, and we all kind of figure out how to normalize them. You know, one team may have 20, 20 discrete, and another one have five. We kind of put them together, and then we just come on and go, and we draw a line where that's where you're that's where you're going to go. Typically, it ends up being just over go to one step into the better. And I, I and I talked about it earlier. This is the one thing a dev manager can play on. And the reason you balance it, and, and best again back to the auto example is, if someone sits in the car, and you have a really nice interior, but it has a shiny plastic glove box door, you're an economy car. Boom. That's the decision they're going to make. So everything gets lowered to your lowest level of sophistication immediately, especially when they can experience so easily. So you're, you've now over-invested everything else, and you got an economy car. The other end is you can do the perforated leather ventilated seats, but no one's going to pay you for it. <laughs> and if you have a high cost and you go in there, you're end up going to get rebates or to move that thing, because that particular package isn't going to sell, because people are just not going to buy it. They're going to go get a luxury car with a luxury brand that has that if they're going to pay that much for it. So this optimization is, is I use the find the level of water <laughs> in the room for that particular release. And when a dev manager has less time and he's constrained, he lowers the level. And when he's got more, because he's figured out how to do it, he ratches it up a little bit to figure out what, what game he can play. But essentially, that's his one variable. It's very clear to him what he's going to do. Find the delighter and gold plate it. Hopefully, it's a thing that you do better than anyone else. That's part of the conversation is, is it defensible? So as your team, you've got three things you could do that are delighters. Let's talk about which one's the one that's going to be sustainable for how long. Things go this way. Things start out as delighters, then they become linears, and then they become musts as the market figures it out. So in high churn areas, you could actually decide, hey, we're going to time to be two steps ahead. Things that we know are delighters and some others that we think are linear, we're going to make them must and we're going to bump them down because we want a competitive advantage or work on something else because our team is really good at X. So over time, we can all think of things, in, you know, whether it was cell phones or cars or whatever, over time, things just kind of fell down into the stack. Again, anytime I've done this with rigor, 20 to 30% of what they thought they needed to do for a release ended up finding that nobody cares. Now, that you filter through, make sure you aren't doing something that needs needs to be done because of regulations or compliance, depending upon what market you're in. You know, I started out saying, hey, I'm going to change your thinking about 2D. It wasn't because I love new language. It's because I'm now giving the engineers a mission that they would never have had before. They understand what is delighting people. They understand what they're there to do to delight that person and they know how they're going to get there. I'll give you an example, the must category. People have a tendency to go, ah, uh, Sashiro Honda. He would go to the Formula One team that he sponsored, mainly to find the most innovative engineers and steal him from the team and put him on his production cars to do the must. That's what his pattern was, to make sure he would come up with things like flipped in cardboard for the wheel wells. Right, that gave them massive money to make the interior nice. So the most innovation with a new mission is still an opportunity for innovation. You've heard of the term uh, thinking out of the box. 
It turns out that isn't very helpful when there's groups involved. You can go think out of the box and do something new, but it's not very repeatable. So what this is about is going from one-dimensional thinking in one box to two-dimensional thinking. The two-dimensional is a whole new box. Everybody has a common definition, a common way to think about it, a common way to deal with it. So it doesn't have to be a new meeting. It can be the standard meeting. It just takes a little bit longer to, to go through the learning curve of moving out of one dimension into two. Yeah, so any questions? Like a no. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you.